recommend you use Flash. It's recording. Uh, thank you, everybody. My name is Ping. Um, now I'm in Hong Kong, and I'm a young junior assistant professor. I started in 2014, so that's by end of third year. So uh, today I'm very excited to give my talk, but um, I still have some jet lag because I just arrived yesterday. So I apologize if I'm kind of sleepy, but I'm trying to uh, give you. Uh, this talk, and uh, you may find it interesting, and we can have some discussions after. So my talk is about structural coloration of metallic surfaces using uh, the elliptical vibration texturing. So that topic, starting with how we see colors in the nature, and we got some inspiration, and we want to reproduce those structures. And uh, in the nature, uh, some color we see are not from the pigment or the dye, but rather from its micro or nano structures. Here are three examples. On the uh, top left is so-called muffled butterflies. And they have some tiny structures, regular, periodic, but so small that is not even possible to see by optical microscopes. So they're beyond the wavelengths, so smaller than the wavelengths, let's say less than 300 or 400 nanometers. And the light and the structures will have very complex interactions that we can see those very beautiful colors. Second example is more commonly seen in our daily life. That's a soap bubble. So that's so-called thin film interference. Uh, basically, when the light comes in, it will reflect on the outside surfaces and partially it will go in through and reflect on the inner surfaces. And they have a distance difference causing the interference of the light to see these varying colors. Uh, that's the uh, thin film interference. A uh, third example is also from other kind of butterflies. Uh, the difference from this, these two is that for this kind of butterflies, they have so-called hierarchical structures. So they have structures in different levels from micro levels, tens of microns, to even nanometers levels. But in, at one scale, you can see that at here or here, they are more like grading structures. Uh, optical gratings can also uh, diffract the light to give you colors. So uh, people learn from the nature. They always want to produce biomimic uh, structures. So actually, these principles have been applied in scientific research. Uh, so starting from the thin film interference, actually that's a quite old art in the uh, Smiths when they're doing the ironing work. So uh, in the past times, um, they actually looking at the quality of the steel by looking at color when they do the tempering or when they uh, crunching or do the uh, thermal, uh, thermal process for the ions. And the principle is that when you do the tempering, they will forming a oxide on top of the steel surfaces. These oxide is semi-transparent, and they can act as a thin film interference. Basically, by controlling the temperature and the time, you can control the thickness of this uh, oxide, and you can control the color. Um, that's the example. Uh, second example is kind of the research, new research trend in these years is that people can create features 
less than the wavelengths, 100 nanometers, 200 nanometers. And the light and the structure will have those so-called plasmonic resonance to give you plasmonic color effects. Uh, the third one is diffraction gratings. And uh, we can see there's two examples that, and also that's we learned in high school physics or even middle high school physics that when the white light was shining on a regular pattern surfaces, the spectrum of the light will be dispersed and you can see a spectrum of the colors, right? Uh, on the left and right are both diffract gratings. So we're going to focus on diffraction gratings. So the diffraction grade itself is pretty simple and can be fully described by the equation of the uh, reflective diffraction gradient equations. Basically, if you know the spacing of the gratings, you know the incident light angle and the wavelength, you can calculate the uh, diffraction angle of the outbound light. So here is two examples of the stuff we can see in common life. On the right hand side is, a spec, uh, is the back of the CD-ROM. And actually, uh, when they uh, burning the data, they can create in kind of semi-regular structures acting as the gratings. And on the left is a optical component in a system. Uh, they are both diffraction gratings, but we can see their different colors. On the left, you see the pure green color, but while on the CD-ROM, you see a rainbow-like color. So what's the difference? So from this appearance, we can actually conclude that this one will have much smaller spacing in the grading. And this one has a larger spacing. Why? Because if you fix the uh, wavelengths of the incident angle, you can see that when you have a smaller spacing, this dispersion angle will be bigger. So the spectrum will open bigger. And from the same angle you see, you will see only one portion of the spectrum, let's say grain. However, if you have a smaller, uh, sorry, larger spacing, this dispersion angle is very small. So you see the whole spectrum, so you see the rainbow color. So that's why we see different. So let's go into talk about manufacturing. So because I'm working in manufacturing, how can we produce diffraction gratings? So in now, actually there are only two ways, uh, like commercially two ways to manufacturing gratings. The first one is called mechanical ruling. It can have a very high precision, but it's a very cost uh, process and very slow. Uh, the principle is simple. You have a single diamond tool, and the tool shape is corresponding to the profile you want. Then you're just scratching the surface one by one to creating line by line of gradings. And you control the spacing by set the, feed, uh, the cross feed of your tool. And it takes a long time to produce, but it can be highly precise. And uh, actually, if you want to, there have many applications in optical system, actually also in defense, also in precision machine tools. And there's, let's say, there are only about maybe 30 companies in the world, totally, can make large scale and uniform diffraction grading. So it's a very, very top uh, technology, even though the principle is simple but it needs very precise tools. The second method is using holographic uh, laser uh, beam etching. Basically, if you have two lasers, they have interference patterns, will be light, black dark, light dark, and you do the etching, and you do other uh, clean processes, and you replicate, you do the, uh, the coating of aluminum, then you got the gratings. Uh, both of them actually are quite expensive, and they are solely used to creating the master mode. The gradients you can buy on the market is the replica of these modes. However, um, they also have a drawback. If you want to use this method to creating structural colors, you have a limitation. Because if you see that, they are not very good at producing variable of spacing. Because the spacing is actually corresponding to certain colors. And here that usually they are used to creating uh, the same spacing, uniform spacing. So how can we find other ways to manufacturing variable spacing for structural coloration? Uh, there is some research about that. Uh, the, 
Uh, right now, the only way I know is to using laser, but you have to using a femtosecond laser. So when the femtosecond laser means that each laser pulse duration is in femtoseconds, that's 10 to the minus 12, I think, yeah, 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So let's say eight femtoseconds, 10 femtoseconds. So when the time scale is so small, the laser and the material will have very complicated interactions. They were creating so-called laser-induced periodic surface structures. Uh, that's also created by some surface plasma. And basically, if you have a laser shining on the material, it will self-organize to creating some semi-regular gratings-like structures. And you can use that to creating structural colors. Um, so people using that way to produce colors, like shown here, and also even drawing pictures. Uh, this is the uh, self-portrait of Van Gogh. And uh, what they do is that they found out when I shine the laser and I can polarize the laser, the gradients I created will be perpendicular to my polarization direction. So during the machining of the surface within laser, I just changing my polarization direction and I can create the grading structures of different direction to creating different colors. So uh, that's a very uh, neat way actually to draw in pictures, right? And uh, there's other researchers creating, you see, this is very interesting. So this is basically, you have a laser and you're just scanning and it was self-organizing uh, to creating those semi-regular grading structures. Um, however, there's some drawbacks. Uh, the first thing is that uh, this is the typical uh, laser process surfaces with the semi-regular gratings. And they are not really regular. Or if I don't tell you it's gratings, you can hardly to see. Because they are statistically have an average spacing, but it's not precise. And it's difficult to predict. No one has the knowledge to predict. Basically, you have to try. And uh, you're using certain material certain process combination, and you get what you have, and you calibrate each time. So it's not very easy uh, to in the mass production. And second is that uh, it's not really uh, flexible, and uh, if you want, say, I just want to create a spacing of 500 nanometers, you can't, because you, you, there's so many variables to try, and it's nonlinear. And, uh, and also, it's very high cost, because a femtosecond laser costs, uh, let's say, 300. Yeah, 300K US dollar or so, excluding even the, the positioning stage systems. So it's uh, some short uh, drawbacks. So can we do similar effect? Oh, I'm sorry. Can I? Uh, OK. <laughs> uh, let me, uh, yeah, I just want to show you my background. OK. <laughs> so can we do similar stuff without uh, a high cost also, we want a high efficiency, better control, better color, better effect, but lower cost and higher speed. So that's the motivation. So basically, we want to using an innovative machining method. And then also, it's more easily to be adopted by industry because it's mechanical machining. Everybody knows what's going on there. So the idea is actually pretty simple. We're going back to the mechanical ruling. So that's the way traditionally machining the gradings but we're turning the tool 90 degree. While we're machining, we add a modulation in the cutting depths. Then you can create those dimples, let's say. But if you look in the perpendicular direction, there are channels. So you're creating small channels perpendicular to a cutting direction. Their width is your cutting width. And their spacing is controlled by your modulation frequency and your cutting speed, right? So they are like machining marks and their uh, gratings. However, this simple idea, I'm very surprised to, that haven't been applied. I couldn't find any paper about it. The reason is two. There's two reasons it's not be applied. The first reason is the processing time. It's, so basically, what kind of motion you can achieve for this one? Let's say in fast tool servo, that's pretty commercial available, but you can reach to up to one kilohertz. But even though one kilohertz, if you want to have a spacing of 500 nanometers, it takes forever. You have to move like point several, point 0.7 millimeter per second or so, very, very slow. And not even to mention to machining a large area. Uh, the second thing is minimal chip signal effect. 
So in micro machining, there's the concept that you cannot machine indefinitely small layers. When the layer is too small, the workpiece will slide in beneath your tool, and no chip will actually form because that you, that's the ratio to the material and your tool sharpness. The third thing is that uh, we are actually dealing with, so here, if the spacing is 500 nanometers, you, know, you are reaching this minimal chip thickness effect. So if you do this, actually you will not get you expected. There are actually not really machining can be stabilized or, uh, or established. And also, this tool is a simplified schematics. The actual tool is commercially is pretty big. You have a nearly zero degree wake angle and a small clearance angle and you will have very complicated inter interference. So your tool will actually impact your workpiece to ruin whatever textures or structures you, you trying to get. So how to solve this? So actually we, we, we invent this way. So now we do a two dimensional vibration and coupled with the velocity. And what we do is kind of uh, overlapping trajectory or kind of spiral trajectory. So with this one, we can actually solve the minimal chip thickness effect because the actual cutting depths is much larger than your feature depths. And these are the result of those overlapping trajectory and all the machining marks. And second, how can we increase the processing efficiency is we were going to apply ultrasonic vibration. So if we can apply the vibration to 20 kilohertz, 30 kilohertz, we can dramatically improve the efficiency to make it reasonable, to make it reasonable. And the third one is there's additional benefit using this method. So this has a very, very high requirement on the efficiency, on the accuracy of your machine. So the relative position of the tool and the workpiece has to be precise. Otherwise, you just ruin everything. Here, that as long as you can touch the workpiece, as long as there's cutting happening, uh, my, work, my tool can be lower or higher, the generated features will be always the same. That's especially useful later when we apply this technology to machining freeform surfaces, that you do not to very, very precisely following the surface. As long as there's cutting happening, the general feature is always the same. Okay, so let's wrap up about the principles. So now we have a circular vibration coupled with a slow linear velocity. And when these two motions are combined, you get an overlapping trajectory and you do a, you know, a, a subtract or, or, or just a, um, <coughs> sorry, you do a subtraction of the trajectory to the workpiece and the machine surface, those regular machining marks, they're actually like gratings. And pay attention that these gratings are in the direction perpendicular to a cutting direction. And uh, then, so this is the first step, then we do line by line, we do line by line, then we can create a whole area of gratings. And uh, here, the spacing of the grating determined by the cutting velocity as well as the angular vibration frequency. So now in our case, our frequency is in ultrasonic range and our processing speed can reach in about 10 to 30 millimeter per second. And you can also vary this cutting velocity to, grade, to get the spacing different, to get different colors. So uh, that is the uh, principle. So let's see, um, so here, the key technology or component here, or special component here, is that you have to have a device that can generate these two-dimensional vibration at an ultrasonic frequency. So what we do is that we design our own. So here is a new design we proposed called a portal frame structure. So it's a very neat, simple structure. Uh, but what we do is that uh, we put piezo plates on the left, let's say, beam, and the right beam, and we can excite this thing. And as we do a model analysis, we can find a natural mode on the bottom left where this tool is swinging left and right. So we can provide the cutting motion vibration at, let's say, 22 kilohertz. And we can do another mode, and this is in uh, depth of cut direction, so going up and down. 
and we optimize the geometry to make these two modes happening at the really identical frequency. Then if we excite this device at this frequency, we can have both modes available. Basically, you see, if you look at this one, these two beams basically move in phase. If you look at the right one, these two beams move anti-phase. So we adjust the excitation signals between the two beams. We can have different combination of these two modes to get whatever elliptical or straight line trajectory we want and adjust the angle as well. Uh, and we do some modeling, analytical modeling, and we compare our result with FEM, but I will not go into detail for mathematics. Let's see some results. That that's our first prototype, second prototype, and we first do a frequency analysis. So the black and red indicating the two modes, and they're coupled here. And here is experiment results. When we're changing the phase angle, we can basically adjusting the true trajectory at the run frequency. Uh, and also, this is a new design. Uh, but this is the old design. Actually, the experiment I'm showing today is done by this tool. That's how I designed uh, during my PhD. Similar principle, using two coupled modes to generating an ultrasonic vibration. Uh, here, I'm showing a video uh, to see the whole process. So initially, uh, we need to make it just flat, so pre-machining. Um, and uh, second, the, in the coloring process, it's very simple, that fast, right? So actually, uh, the tool moving at a varying speed, not the same speed. And uh, the whole process is like two, three minutes. And you see this is a half panda, and we, we, we finish it. Uh, it's a whole panda, and this line here is because we stop in the middle. So basically, we're adjusting the speed. You can create pictures. So here, I have a workpiece machined by a method. It's a Mona Lisa, and uh, you can pass it around to see. But uh, it's a diffraction grating, so it actually needs outside light. So when I see here, I think I don't see the light is um, too good. So if you have an iPhone or cell phone, you just open the, um, the flashlight, and you adjust a certain angle, it's a very amazing uh, piece. And I just pass around, and I encourage you to using some flashlight to get best result. Otherwise, the light here is not good enough to see it clearly. So you just can pass around, and uh, using, if you have a cell phone to see, it's a very cool piece. OK, so uh, what we do is that the principle is simple. We're just verifying if it's going to work. So we first machined one workpiece. And uh, this is the same workpiece because it diffraction gratings. So from different angles, you see different colors, right? And we can, uh, by changing the angle, we see different colors. And if you notice that later, I will also compare our results with those from laser processing. And you will see that we have a much higher diffraction efficiency and a much better effect. And we measure the uh, microstructures or the AFM uh, results, and you can see very regular patterns. So basically, the tool cutting this way while vibrating in and out in the screen, and you got those grading structures. And we measure the profile. So very luckily, we don't have much control of the tool vibration trajectories, always ellipse. And, uh, uh, but the result showing that it's very close to the Best one is the blaze grading structure. So it's very similar to the blaze grading structures. So to very likely to get the result we want. And uh, second, we also machine, you know, different grading spacing. And when we look at the same angle, we can create a spectrum. Using this principle, we can draw images, right? So here we're creating gradings of 400 nanometers, 440, 480, each by 40 nanometers up to 760 nanometers, and we can create a spectrum of colors at a certain angle. Then we also try different materials. We try aluminum, uh, okay. We try copper. We also try stainless steel. So here is very interesting because normally we don't using uh, here we're using single crystal diamond tool to cut. But normally, people don't use single crystal diamond to cut ferrous materials because their interaction about carbon and, and the ferrous materials. Uh, it will make the tool wear extremely fast. 
But previously, people already trying to using this vibration cutting to cut ferrous material because you will notice that I make the contact time much less. So during each cycle, only a portion of the time the tool uh, interact with the workpiece. So they are interrupted cutting. So that much the tool much longer. So actually later we also machine pretty large area of stainless steel and we don't see much tool wear. So it's a very reliable knowledge to also to machining stainless steel later uh, in other applications I'm going to show. So um, we also study basically what's the minimal feature size we can do. So basically in principle you can decrease your feeding velocity and you'll get smaller and smaller features, but there is a, a limit. The limit we get is the 300 nanometers. So below 300 nanometers, the result will not be what we expected. Uh, the reason is that there's still minimum chip, chip, uh, minimum chip signal effect ticking in. There are also tool and workpiece interference ticking in. So that's the minimum we can get. But if we optimize the tool geometry, maybe later we can go even smaller. Uh, and for the larger, there's no problem. So we tried from 300 nanometers up to 1.3 micron. Uh, for the larger one, there's no problem. Even larger is easier for machining. So the machining difficulty is machine tiny features difficult. Uh, we also tried trying to see, as we mentioned before, what about the cutting depths? So we tried the cutting depths. There has no effect, as we mentioned. As long as the tool and the workpiece contacts, the cutting depths does not affect the final feature size. So for one, two, three, there are different cutting depths, but the result or the optical visual effect is the same. And here is the cross feed that you have to make sure the cross feed had to be small enough, otherwise there will be area without the textures. Um, here we compare with the laser, as we mentioned before. On the left, top left, this is where coming from the laser. And on the right is where coming from our method. So you can see that it's much, much regular, and that determines your diffraction efficiency and determines the effect. So here is the laser effect, and here is our effect. So you can see the color is much better. Uh, so we, I compare that we have higher diffraction efficiency. So the spacing is analytically predictable, very easy. You just calculate the speed. And it's fast and flexible and low cost, uh, and we can control the spacing. So that's our comparison with the laser method. So the principle is simple, then we can explore different applications. Uh, here we do some selective texturing, so we're only cutting in the middle. That's our acronym for the school. And we also control the angle. So each line, we have different angle of diffraction grading, so you can have different colors. And we can also do velocity control, as we mentioned. So here, we're using a step profile. So within each color block, it's the same speed. But between, and we control the profile to be a step velocity, and you have color blocks. And uh, you can also uh, take in an image, and on each pixel, you have a color, and you transform this color to a particular velocity. So you transform an image to a velocity matrix, and you can process an image to get, uh, this is our university logo, uh, but there's only two colors. This is uh, Mona Lisa, and we divide it color into 16 levels, and each pixel is 40 by 40 micron. Uh, but the one you see is not the same one here. They're a little bit different, but both are pretty good. Um, here, uh, we also put the scale of the image as well as the time. You can see that it's reasonable time. So for such a complicated image, I only take 20 minutes to process. The image I'm showing you around I think it's similar, between 10 to 20 minutes to, 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 to machine. So it's quite fast. If, if you think about that on that, each feature is only 500 nanometers away, and you can divide how much you need to do. But if you do the calculation, we are using around 30 kilohertz. So every second, I can create 30,000 gradings every second. So that's the efficiency we have. Uh, this some new result. We, we do a, a reverse Adidas, <laughs> and we do uh, Starbucks, and we do some uh, Chinese characters, uh, cartoons. That's dragon, sheep, a dog, a, a rat. I don't know. Anyway, 
So that's the taste of my students, not my taste. <laughs> anyway, so uh, then we talk about how can we just moving forward, just to explore more. We want to have an algorithm to rendering better pictures. We are still on the way, uh, not yet. So the Mona Lisa I'm showing you is not so satisfactory. We are still improving. So what we do is that uh, initially, the very basic print, uh, idea is that you have an image, you've got an RGB matrix, and uh, the RGB matrix color some nonlinear transformation corresponding to certain wavelengths and a certain velocity you want to cut. And finally, you got a velocity matrix. And for each line, this is the velocity profile you want to reach. For each pixel, you have a speed, right? But in reality, it's not the case because in reality, the machine has inertia and they had huge inertia, they're large machines. And uh, you have certain problems and uh, the Accuracy determined by first, how well the machine can control its velocity. Second is when there is transition, ideally you want a sharp transition, but actually there will be overshoot, I'm not showing here, there will be overshoot, uh, there will be a transition period that will affect your resolution. And uh, you can of course, increasing the acceleration rate of your machine, but you are causing instability, you are causing overshoot, and et cetera. So there's a balance there. So you cannot create an arbitrary small pixel, right? Uh, so instead of doing this, let's think of the other way. So what we're trying to do is that instead to doing this, I do a PVT continuous changing. So I'm using a PVT, uh, which is a interpolate method in common CNC controllers and I try to fit the ideal curve, and I try to minimize this error to do optimization. So now, instead of doing this, I do a continuous varying changing, right? And I'm minimizing my error. Uh, so here is one example here. So this is a Mona Lisa cut by the PVT method, and uh, we see the uh, we see the blue one is the ideal, ideal features. The red dots are the control points. So we're trying to optimize to add the control points and how many we want and do the PVT interpolation between each control points. And you will see that it's basically acting as a low pass filters, right? Which is reasonable because in this uh, area here, it's actually not possible for the machine to changing the speed so instantaneously. So we have to have a balance between the smoothness uh, and also as uh, the sharpness of the color. So we also do a PVT on a complex image because we think it's more advantage to basically representing the tiny shade change of the color, right? So this is original image and this is, this is the same one but different, different, different angles. So we see that it's good at rendering those very complicated shade change. But there's also a drawback. There is a figuring right here on a boat, but it's kind of lost here. Uh, because the PVT like low pass filters, so it will actually blur the boundaries. So we are thinking maybe we can, using the both advantage, trying to still retain the boundary, but to making the color change uh, represented. So that's, we are still on the way for, for this uh, algorithm. Okay, so um, some application, we just you know random applications. We can do anti counterfeiting or we can do QR code. Uh, this actually work. This will go into my uh, website, uh, my lab website. And uh, we do injection molding. So even though we can create in the molds fast, but not fast enough, if we can even further increasing the speed, that's will be better. So we're creating the structures on an injection mode, and we do plastic injection molding. So here is initial results that you can see kind of difference, right? This is blue, this is green, uh, but it's not ideal compared with the metals uh, because you always lose the um, accuracy or the structure depths when you do a transferring. 
So we are trying to first improving our mold quality. Second is that we're using aluminum, and only after 100 cycles, we checked the aluminum, all the textures are gone. So during the high temperature, high pressure, uh, they are not good enough. So now, in the next batch, we made on stainless steel, as we mentioned before, and we are trying to see if we can get better results. Um, another application is for optical variable devices, OVD. So that's, you see on passport, your ID cards, driver license, and banknotes. So this technology was first uh, using by MasterCard in 1982, and the exact method is not clear, it's a commercial secret. Uh, but we propose one very interesting. So basically, if we can cut image with certain nano grading uh, spacing, and they will be only viewable from certain degree, as you see those uh, Mona Lisa. For this one, for example, its best viewing angle is between 40 to 60. All of this range is not so good because determined by diffraction grading equations. Similarly, we can create a horse that's optically good in 10 to 30 degrees, and we combine these two together. So what we do is each line is different image. First line, we cut the horse. Second line, we cut the uh, seagull or the bird, and the horse and bird and horse and bird. And finally, what we get is an image that will be different, viewing from different angles. So that's the piece that from 20 degree, you see a horse, and in the middle, you see both, and in the other end, you see only the, uh, only the, the, the bird. So that also could be anti-counterfeiting, etc. So we are also trying to explore what's the real industrial applications, because people always talk to me, say, this is interesting, but what's your application I'm trying to find? Um, here is the, uh, you know, the grading structures we machined. OK, so yeah, I'm almost on time. So conclusion is that we, using an innovative but traditional machining method, and can, can do some fascinating things. Basically, we're creating uh, vibration to modulation to creating uh, microstructures. Uh, one application is for structural coloration. Um, and uh, this is the grading of our, this talk. But I also want to uh, take another five to 10 minutes to talk about other research we are doing, which is also, I think, is very interesting. Uh, so basically, my PhD work is creating microstructured functional surfaces. And not here is one example. Uh, we're also creating structures that is good for friction reduction, or structures that are good for antibacteria. And uh, there's a lot of research about that, but our focus is how to manufacture them efficiently, low cost, and fast. That's my focus. So one of my new projects is that we are going to making a stamp those stamps have micro features on it, and I apply this ultrasonic vibration to fast replicate on um, surfaces, like say biomedical implants, titanium, and uh, we can also do some uh, other processes. But the application is that we can make them to be good for some stem cells, and we can maybe uh, guide the stem cell to differentiate to certain type we want, and there's some biomedical applications. Others I do friction reduction and antibacteria. So that's one major area I'm doing, using ultrasonic vibration to do cutting or forming to creating uh, micro-functional surfaces. Uh, the second area I'm doing is 3D printing, which is also very hot today. So what my focus is to printing functional materials. So I do three skills. In nano skills, I'm using electrospinning, which is a very long history process. You have a polymer, which is dielectric. You apply a high voltage it will shoot out nanofibers because of the repulsion force. And we can control this fiber to do deposition. It's like FDM in nanoscale. FDM is the uh, fused deposition modeling, which the 3D printing machine you can buy. So we can control these nanofibers to do some deposition. In the meso scale, I do project lithography. So basically, you're using a projector to project image in the UV curable resin. So what we do is we put some functional particles, like magnets particles, and we're using a magnet to control this distribution, then creating the products that are functional. So they respond to a certain external field. Uh, also, in massive scale, 
we do uh, metal printing. Uh, this is a, a new machine basically I designed, but it, each component is buy from the market, but I assemble them. And we're trying to use this method to print in metals as well as titanium alloy, uh, mostly nickel based. So for shape memory alloy, and also for some ceramics, piezo ceramics. So we, can, we want to print a structure, both has mechanical frame, as well as the functional component, actuators, all in one. That's the goal. Uh, the third one is a very interesting invention I made about one year ago. So this little device, this uh, funny figuring is just saying that they can load mass. So this device actually floating on the table, but I didn't use any magnets. I didn't use any air. So basically the principle is that the air itself is a vis viscous fluid. If you're vibrating in the air, the air will not be squeezed out instantaneously. So if you're vibrating fast enough, it will self-forming a stable air film to lifting your device. And it could be pretty large force. The levitation force is square, inverse square proportional to the levitation distance, right? One over R square, where R is the clearance. So we can vibrating the top device using ultrasonic vibration, using also its relevant frequency, and to make it lifting. And what's more interesting is that I can control its posture in the air. So I can control its unbalance. So if it's vibrating unbalanced, particular to one direction, or it's moving towards direction, if you can control which direction it is unbalanced, you just move it around. So basically all these wires is just for passing the currents or voltage. There's no dragging or no force in these wires. So uh, let me show this video again so I can control it in two-dimensional motion. And uh, based on that, uh, based on that, that's the principle using coupled random vibration. We also designed an encoder. Uh, we just put four, four metal plates. These four metal plates and the stuff floating in the air, they form a capacitor. And uh, you can, using the overlapping area to calculating its position 3D in, in, in the space. All, all, all X, Y, and Z. And that's encoder, and we do control, and we can make it as a position positioner in the air to moving around to do arbitrary trajectory. Uh, later, that's a conceptual. This is already done. Later, we want to say we can make it to be coupled with some manufacturing devices, let's say a laser. So we can using this to um, operating or processing some silicons or some delicate surfaces because my machine will not touching the workpiece, just floating around it and moving around and to do some machining. So make, you can make it tiny, right? Because the, the device I'm showing here is smaller than my hand, very small machine. So we can make so-called a machine on a workpiece rather than feed the workpiece into the machine. So that's some, I think, interesting stuff I'm doing. Uh, this is my team right now. I have a postdoc, two PhD students, uh, my MPhil students, and my research assistant. So uh, the majority of work I'm showing you today is done by my PhD student, Young. Uh, so thank you for him. OK, so thank you very much. And I think I'm right on time and leave you some time for questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you are kind of generating the Rossi profile. Mm -hmm. You are not taking the dynamics of the complex integration, right? No. So do you think if you take that integration, that can improve your dynamics? Yes, so the spacing will not be changed by dynamics because that's only determined by the vibration frequency. But the profile you generated or the quality is definitely influenced by your, uh, by your dynamics. So right now what we are doing is you want to have a perfect structure for a grading structure. Actually, it cannot be generated by this sinusoid vibration because for the relative vibration, it's always sinusoid. 
harmonic. So what we do is that we, uh, we design a device that can generate arbitrary direct, uh, to track trajectory. So if you want to have a basically a more triangular grading structures, you need to, we are trying to use a new tool to creating the trajectory. But again, this is without the dynamics. You have to both consider dynamics as well as two directory to get optimal. Yeah, that's the direction we're going. Any other questions? Do you know the the, the cutting depths or the maximum cutting depths usually we set is about five to 10 micron. Or we just move, want to move a very thin layer. And the second thing is because we are using an error attack stage, they are very precise, not only the resolution, but they are not designed for machining. They have very low stiffness, so we cannot cut too, too much. Uh, in the lateral processing speed, it's about 10 to 20 millimeter per second. So the Mona Lisa I'm passing around takes about, uh, if we don't count in the initial uh, flattening process, uh, the actual texturing will take 10 to 20 minutes. So it's okay, speed. Yeah. Did you ever find that the, the device that you're using to actually create your depth of cut variations, did it induce any sort of like modes on your machine tool structure? Yes, so the Mona Lisa I'm showing you, they have a kind of a ripple-like and visible, which means it's in maybe millimeter or some millimeter. Uh, these are actually the dynamics. So we think there's some chattering happening there. And uh, maybe because of our positioning stage have too low stiffness, it's not designed for machining. So we want to move it to actual CNC machine to see if we'll remove those ripples. Uh, others, we are also trying to study the chattering or nonlinear dynamics in it. But definitely, if you see those Mona Lisa, they're kind of, those ripples are not expected. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, is there any utility in trying to do this on a, on a curved Yes. Uh, we, um, so in principle, there's no problem. We just using multi-axis just to following the thing. Uh, right now, what the major challenge we have is, well, what I want to do is that, in reality, I want to do is if I, you give me a free surface, I'm not starting from scratch. So I give you give me a free form surface, which maybe the precise profile I don't know. Can I still track him? So if I'm using force tracking, maybe I can do that. So that's the next project I'm trying to do. So if you start from scratch, you machine a free form surface, that's no problem. But what if you give me an arbitrary surface? Can I just follow it? Maybe using some force tracking. Uh, that's the goal we're trying to do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.